I'll be speaking to one important personality here today on the channel. Um, he's a presidential aspirant. So today you, you can you I, I think you have an idea of who we are going to talk to on the channel and we have a lot to discuss. So I'll just plead with you to stay glued to the channel and listen to what he has to say. We go make them, make them. We go, we go make them, make them. Hey, we go make them. Make Please welcome to my channel. Thank you, Nay. Uh, How are you? <laughs> I'm fine. I'm fine. Good, 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 good. Good to be here. Thank you for having me thank here. Thank you. Thank you for yeah. honoring my invitation to be on my channel. And I'm glad my people will be so happy to have you. I salute also your people. <laughs> so, guys, um, I have you with me. As I told you, I'm a very important personality. Oh, don't worry. I'm not, I'm not <laughs> that important. <laughs> so, please, can you just introduce yourself to right. people? So my name is Marek Kofi Gan. Okay. Uh, people call me Kofi Ghana. Uh, an old lady started that process, <laughs> so now everybody calls me Kofi Ghana. Okay. But my name is Marek Kofi Ghana. I like the Kofi in the middle. Yeah. Um, yeah. And I, I am a full-blooded Ghanaian. I, I was born in the Volta region, uh, Keta Government Hospital. Uh, lived all my childhood between Keta and then uh, at some point, I think I was, I don't know how, how old I was, but we moved to Liberia, Nigeria. And then I came back to Ghana for my secondary school, uh, back to Keta Secondary School. Uh, and then uh, after that, I studied for my accountancy professional exam, passed, and then worked as an auditor, worked as a consultant, uh, and then traveled outside of the country for a number of years. Worked with some really, really good organizations as well out there, which, which really added a lot of, uh, you know, uh, experience to uh, what I acquired here. Um, been to about 20 or so countries uh, for work, uh, largely for work, not for pleasure. Africa, okay. uh, mostly Africa and Southeast Asia, so most of the uh, developing countries. So in Africa, largely any, most of the countries where there's been conflict or mm -hmm you know, uh, emergency need for support and all that. Um, so I, I used to work in international development, and that includes Ghana, actually, okay. because we had an office here. And then after that, um, I've decided to come back to Ghana and, and champion something bigger than myself. So, yes. so that's why I'm here. Good, good. So, <laughs> um, he's in Ghana to, he's aspiring as a president for Ghana, and I have the honor to interview him. But before we go into that, guys, um, we want to talk a little about um, his personal experience living outside Africa. He's been the diaspora, so he knows a lot. <laughs> yeah, I so, do. Uh, let's talk a little about <laughs> the diaspora. We move back to Africa, then we channel it down to Ghana. Right. And we ask him why he decided to stand as an aspiring candidate for 2020. 2020. Yeah. 2020. Right. So, <laughs> so tell us, how long have you been in the diaspora? Well, I used to be in the diaspora for close to 12, 13 years. Look, it's, it's been one of the craziest experiences. I mean, uh, so I, I, I had already chartered as an accountant before I left. And you know, in Ghana, if you're a chartered accountant, you're, you're a big man. Yeah, <laughs> you know? exactly. But I went to the UK and we call London the leveler. Because when you go down there, everybody's on the same level, you know. Um, so I went in there, and, and I think most people experience this. You, I didn't get my first job in accountancy, and it means I had to do every other thing. But, you know, that's, that's the environment. Um, so I, I, I remember I worked as a cleaner. I've worked in cleaning before. Um, I've worked as a security guard. Um, I enjoyed that one. <laughs> um, I worked as a construction in the construction site before, um, and then I've done you know bits and pieces of other things here and there. Um, before finally landing my first job in actual accounting and, and and auditing and all that. So, I mean, for me, things like that they 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 shape they shape your personality. You know. Uh, uh, unlike, 
people who come go abroad and because of a qualification they have they tell you i don't mean i can't do that but you you need to survive you need exactly. to eat you know you need to pay your rent you need to pay your fees or whatever you know so those are experiences that you know luckily for me i must say that i grew up in a very humble environment i grew up as a fisherman's son uh, well, my grandfather was a fisherman uh, I used to sell foes with my, my grandma in the Keta uh, market on certain days. I think it was every three days. Uh, it was a market day. So it wasn't, it wasn't mm -hmm. you know, you would think it's not yeah. below me to go and work as a security guard. Uh, you know, that's, I grew up like that. Um, so those are the experiences I carry along. Um, and, and suffice to say, once you've been there a lot longer, it becomes difficult to want to come back home. For most people, it's difficult yeah. to want to come back home because it's a dilemma. Mm -hmm. And the dilemma usually is that things work. Mm -hmm. You know, over there, it may be a hard life sometimes. You don't have family around. It's lonely. Mm -hmm. uh, when I went initially, I didn't have family. So it was quite lonely. You know, you don't have anybody to talk to. It's not ex exceptionally as friendly as, you know, United States and all that. Uh, it's a bit of a very cold environment. And so you miss all that. But you also know that um, if you work for, say, just about seven hours, the salary you're making is probably somebody's monthly salary. Exactly. <laughs> so you can melt it here in Ghana and, and get some more out of it. So... All of those considerations and also considering the fact that, you know, the system out there, things work, you know, to some large extent, things work. So, you know for a fact, if you get up in the morning, you go to a job, you work for eight hours, you know you can make X out of that. You know, you know if you're putting effort A, B, C, you know you will get X, Y, Z. Mm -hmm. You know, unlike here where, you know more often than not um, yes you can get some jobs done and progress but more often than not you also realize that you can't run away from the fact that if you don't know people you can't make things happen yeah. you know and, and that's something that people grapple with and if you're being there and you're used to just putting in an effort and getting results then it becomes a bit difficult when you feel that you necessarily have to go through somebody um, and if you don't do that, what you realize is that there are people who they don't even put in any extra effort, but because of probably co political connections, they may not put in as much effort as you put in, but they always, say, always make more than you do. So it's these considerations that become a dilemma, you know, for people in the diaspora. And I think the other big thing is people feel that, you know, I've lived there all my life. I'm coming back. I don't have anything to show for it. And therefore, they, they feel the pressure on them. It's shameful that you're coming from a brochure and yeah. you don't have anything <laughs> to show for it. Yeah, and it, it puts people in that. But, you know, the reality is that you, you find that nobody actually cares about those oh, things, course. you know. Um, so, so, yeah, it's a dilemma for being a diaspora. <laughs> <laughs> well, but I have braved it, so that, anybody that's, can. That's really interesting. interesting. Yeah. But I want to ask this question. What is one of the biggest challenge for people, especially Africans in the diaspora? I think it's the acceptance. I think largely it's the acceptance. I, I think it's, um, you know, those are not things we talk about. These are things that you can't even prove it. it it's always something that, you know, is simmering in the background. Um, I was lucky in most of the places I have worked in, you know, uh, I've worked as a professional, so in those kind of environment, once you can deliver, mm -hmm. you know, you are accepted, you can deliver, you know. Um, but we can't also run away from the fact that there are some environments that you have to do twice as everybody else in order to get accepted. That's one. I, I think the other biggest thing also is that you usually are there without family. And the system is very so structured that there is no, 
you know, you can't go to your landlord and say, Master, this, as for this, this <laughs> month, you know, yeah. this month you have to, you know, help me because uh, things are not moving. Mm -hmm. So this month, let me skip this month. You can't do that yeah. elsewhere. You know, you are either in there or you are not in there. You are either paying or you are not paying. Mm -hmm. So it's that there's no human face sometimes. Whereas here, there's a lot of humanity in everything we do. We're very interconnected. It's almost always family. Uh, that's what you miss out when you're out there. And of course, the food. But let me ask this. Do you miss home? <laughs> um, I mean, I have been back for a while now. So, But yes, when I was there, I used to miss home. A lot. It will be... Anybody there who says they don't miss home was probably running away from something. Yeah, that's true. That's true. <laughs> and I have met people who just didn't want to know anything more about, you know, uh, Africa. A few people like that. I had one friend uh, who comes from another West African country, and uh, we used to live together in a neighborhood. And at the point, he was like, you know, with the experiences I've had in Africa, I don't want anything to do with you guys. So... He actually moved way up into the north of, uh, of England just to get away from, you know, anywhere there are so many Africans. But people, people go to some of these places because they are actually running away from something. Uh, so we do have a lot of work to do to keep our people here and make it, you know, exciting for those who want to come back to come back. Because, you know, this is the future. Africa is the future. Africa is the future. We we'll yeah. always keep on seeing. It is the future, no Africa. doubt. Because you can see a lot of people yeah. trooping in. Especially but we've got to work it. Yeah. We have to work it. We, we have to consciously work it. Okay, we'll come to that. <laughs> <laughs> we'll come to that, but let me ask this question. Mm. So what finally um, got you moving back home? Oh, I think it was in large part this agenda I am on now. Um, I had to be here to make it happen. So I moved here back about three, four years ago. Um, and I've been here since. In fact, a lot of people still think I'm outside. Um, everybody makes that assumption because you've been out for so long. Yeah. When you sneak back in, nobody even knows that you are here. Um, but I think people know now that I am here. Um, but it's because of this agenda that I had to be back. Um, you know, when you move around a lot, as I have, and you come back every time. I've always been here at least two, three months every year. Um, and you come back home, you know, until the last four years, anyway, where I've been here permanently. But when you move around a lot and you come back, one of the very immediate questions you start to ask yourself is, you know, with the kind of resources we have, with the kind of human capacity we have, uh, with the kind of peace that we have, you know, you start to ask yourself, why aren't we like the others? You know, because uh, they don't have as much as we have, and yet they've achieved so much. So it, it, it was a constant thing that kept nagging at me. And the more you traveled out, the more it was a very nagging question. Yeah. Because you can't run away from the fact that you're Ghanaian. I, I will never be anything more than a Ghanaian. Um, but you can't also run away from the fact that, you know, with what we've had, we have, we should have been somewhere better than where we are. And so it's that thing that, you know, eventually you decide, I decided that I can't sit on the fence anymore. Um, uh, and here's my slogan I always share with people, and I want to share with you, is that we've had independence for 63 years now plus. Um, the real, we don't have another 60 years to waste. We don't have another 60 years to waste. So we, we've either got to make it happen now or we've lost it. Somebody, uh, an Asian once told me, uh, here's a true story. I met him at a conference. He's an old man. As soon as he heard I was Ghanaian, he said, oh, Ghana, Gold Coast. And I was excited. We were talking. And then he, he, he shared his story. So he was one of those young people very early on during Lee Kuan Yew's time. Mm -hmm. And he says he remembers that they, he, they, they came here to kind of uh, learn, you know, just 
get a grasp from some of our ministers back in those days because back in those days Ghana was considered as yeah. you know um so in his mind he felt oh we were almost at the same level as them now or even you know above that and so we got talking for a long while and he said you know what every country every number of years they get a window it's a window of bright opportunity that they have to explore um, and that every time that window opens in a small way and you don't push yourself through it it will take you another number of years before another window opens and i feel right now is our opportunity that window is open now we've got a very youthful population um africa is on the rise you know we've there's a lot of things open to us now you know technology is here so we don't have to spend as much time to catch up as others have. So, you know, I feel we have that opportunity now. Not just Ghana, but just Africa generally. Wow. I like that. <laughs> that really worked for me. <laughs> like that. But I want to ask this question mm. on behalf of um, people in the diaspora watching us. Um, when you finally moved back home, mm. did it take you some time to fix in? Did it take you time? Like, was there a time you felt you felt like going back? <laughs> um, because uh, there are a lot of people in the diaspora who yeah. want to move, but it's tough. Sometimes, yes. Yeah. So sometimes you people sharing your experience helps makes them to think differently. Have some kind of stable mind. Yeah. Look, I, I I think there's different things that go into you moving back. Um, Certainly, one thing I said to people is that build your networks. You know, um, you would always need somebody to show you something when you're back. So, build your networks. Don't only call people when you need something in Ghana. You know, keep your networks open, your old schoolmates, your former colleagues. Keep the networks open. It's, it's easier when you come back and you have a network of people you can fall back on. Um, but, you know, when you've lived in different places, uh, yes, there are times that you wish things work differently. Um, you know, so many different occasions where you felt, you know, should I go back? But in my case, that was not an option because I came for exactly one reason and one reason only. Uh, even though this has always been home, I've always been here anyway. So... I guess, in a way, it was a little easier on me. I, I think the other thing I advise people who want to come back is that, look, don't, don't stay out there your entire life and then one day you get up and say, I want to come back. No, you need to start coming back, you know, spend two, three months every year, spend four months and then increase it. And before you know it, you, you're already, you know, because there's a lot of... Uh, cultural shift again just like when you left here and went abroad there was a cultural shift in your thinking when you do come back again it's a reverse cultural shift you need to change the way you do things uh, um, keeping time is one of them yes um, africa we have something called africa african time you know uh, i used to i i still do that i i go for meetings people don't show up 15 minutes i leave um, and then you leave before people tell you, oh, I've just arrived, where are you? And I say, well, I waited for 15 minutes. So, oh, well, 15 minutes, you know, it's, it's just 15 minutes. I said, no, <laughs> it's not just 15 minutes. It's 15 minutes of my life you've just wasted. Uh, you can't get it back. You can't give it to me back. So, um, but over time, here's what I say. Once you do that enough, people know this is what you stand for. They may play that game with everybody else, but not with you because they know you would leave. Uh, so it's about being principled. Uh, you know, I think um, you, you become the game changer. You so. become, you set the standard for everybody to follow. All right, so talking about Africa, we all know what is going on in the world. With the, we are facing with this pandemic, and there has been a lot of things happening on the continent of Africa. Mm. My question is that... Um, what is your view on this pandemic? And then, do you, think it, do you think it is a great opportunity for Africa, African countries to liberate themselves from the Western world and start producing things on their own? Ah, 
That's a, that's a brilliant question. Um, I, I think the pandemic, even though it's come to disrupt a lot of things, I, I also think it is... Um, it has spoken on all our behalf. It is, COVID has been able to say things that people know but wouldn't say. Um, it has exposed a lot about the systems we've been building up to this point and has been able to show whether indeed we were building systems or not. Uh, and I think that's a crucial thing that uh, aside the, uh, the disease itself, COVID has been able to do for us. So in a sense, that's a good thing. Um, because it, it's almost as though COVID has become our reality check to say, look, mm -hmm. you say you've been building health systems, educational systems, economic systems for close to 27 years or in some cases 50 years, 60 years, whatever number of years. Mm -hmm. But have you really been building that? And I think that's a critical thing COVID has done for us is to stop us and ask the question, you, have you really been doing this? So in that sense, that's a good thing. Um, you know what? <laughs> <laughs> to answer the second question you asked me, which is that do I think now is the opportunity for Africans to liberate themselves? Mm -hmm. I, I think that thing, that, it, it's not even about COVID. That, that is a thing that should be happening a long time ago. It should be happening yesterday. Um, yes, I think COVID has emphasize why it is even more crucial now because i tell you what after covid a lot of countries are going to be inward looking mm -hmm. most countries that used to depend on external others to make the economies happen are going to be saying no after everything we've seen we've got to learn to be to some extent self-sustaining and then what we can do we get from outside it also means that, you know, we are largely exporting continent. We export a lot of raw materials and all that. What it means is that we're, we're going to have to start finding ways of adding value. We, and this is a conversation that every government has said, has talked about, oh, we want to, you know, add value to our resources. Everybody says that, but nobody does that. Now, it, it cannot be talk anymore. It has to happen. So... Um, I suppose the question you ask is two ways. Yes, I think now is the time, but I also think that it's something we should have done way back. I mean, why would you have resources and not add value to them when you can get more from the valuable ones? And, and here's the thing people we miss in Africa. Um, people talk about, oh, we want to create industries and all that, but you know, the real economy is education. That's the real economy. I, I, I don't know how to get that down to people, but look, every country that has succeeded has succeeded because the world buys and sells education. It's as simple as that. This shirt I am wearing is education because it simply is cotton. Mm -hmm. You need to understand how the qualities of cotton, the, uh, the chemical elements, components of cotton. You need to understand what to do together to put it in this format. You need to understand how to create the machinery to sew it. Those are all education. It's, it's knowledge. And so if we can develop our knowledge to a certain level, we can begin to do a lot of things that currently we have to import in. So... If Africa is going to go forward, it's, it's the youth, it's the knowledge, and it's about believing in our own people. If we get those three things right, it's about believing in our own people. It's about believing in our own people. <laughs> I think the next question I'm going to ask you, before mm. I said it. What's that? That if, is Africa mature enough to take things in their own hands and stop depending on the You've said it already. <laughs> uh, yeah, I mean, uh, there's there's so many angles to it. I, I think I think Africa is mature. I I think intellectually we have some maturity. Look, we're we're in a better place than where China started from. Mm -hmm. We just need the political will to back it. Okay. You take Ghana for example. We many businesses have been destroyed in this country because of political, you know, uh, vindictiveness. 
if those back in the 70s and 60, 70s especially and, and 80s and the rest, a lot of business, especially 80s, a lot of businesses were collapsed purely from vindictiveness. If those, and, and I'm not talking small businesses, I'm talking yeah. businesses that used to manufacture, that used to, you know, a lot of them were collapsed. If those businesses were still there today, we used to have businesses that are soap manufacturing, indigenous Ghanaian companies. Today, we still import things like soap and all that. You know, we had companies in this country that were, uh, it's painful. It's very painful. If those companies were still here today, because as a company, you never just exist. The more you manufacture, the more you explore other areas, the more you grow. You know, the more your capabilities expand. And people going through those companies, maybe they are there one year and they move on, they are also learning. And so we are actually not just industrializing, but we're also producing thinkers, industrial thinkers. You know, but when you collapse, then you have to start all over again. It's so sad. Yeah. I, <laughs> I start to be corrected, though. I used to say, when, when you look at Ghana, we have a lot of um, banks that are coming from outside. But I'm still yet to see a, a, a bank from Ghana that has crossed the shores of Ghana. <laughs> No comments. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I'm, I'm still waiting. Well, if if you say that somebody might say Ghana Commercial Bank is in London, but that's just a branch. It's not it's operating a, yeah. as going there to win UK mm -hmm. businesses. It's operating as a branch for you know people to do business with Ghana. Um, so no, I I I, um, I totally agree with you. But there's this talk on Africa, especially that democracy is not good for Africa. I don't. I, I think it's the way we have practiced democracy. No, I don't. I don't think the question is about. I, I. I think it's always good. I mean, I wouldn't prefer the previous regimes where it's all military, everybody taking a gun and running the show when they want to. So, in that sense alone, democracy in a way is good because it gives people a voice. It's better than no voice at all. I think what we haven't done well is how we have practiced democracy. You know, um, for me, my understanding of democracy largely is about ensuring that when you go forward as a country, you're going forward by carrying out the mandate that the people want carried out. What we've ended up doing largely is that we've found ourselves in a situation where the people are there. Mm -hmm. The parties are here, mm -hmm. the country is here, and there's work to be done. The people want X to be done. The parties tell the people we will do X for country to go forward. The people give them mandates. Parties come into power. Their values not being added to them. Their lives are not getting better. But the small group of people in the political sphere of things are amassing wealth. Their lives are getting better, and the cycle keeps going round and round. Because here's the thing we don't see. The party big men who send their kids abroad and give a certain level of education that is not at par with what their kids are getting to the masses. The masses increase in number, they get to a point. Guess who is, when these guys die out and leave the scene, their kids are going to come back. They have the skill set because they went to the best schools. Um, they have the knowledge. They've got their fathers and their mothers' money, so they have the resources to back them. Guess who's going to continue taking control? It's the same people, same families. So it's going to be a, it's a cycle that is going to go on. Until we liberate the masses, the people, and give them the same... I want to see people, you know, it doesn't care where you are from this country, have the same level of exceptional education as somebody in the UK or the US would have, um, and be empowered to create opportunities for yourself. When that happens, it means that we've literally just empowered the masses, 
And, and the whole idea of politics changes. It becomes a different kind of politics. Now, these guys here don't have a choice but to actually serve. Because these guys who are the masses are actually as powerful as they are. Currently as it is, the shift of power is very one-sided. It's with a few who have the money and who have the control and, and who can do anything with those control and that money as well. So that needs to change. Wow. That really needs to change. <laughs> it, a lot of Africans are calling for the One Africa. Some are calling it United Nations of Africa. Mm -hmm. Others are calling the United um, States of Africa. Mm. Please, just share with me. <laughs> <laughs> What's your view on this? And do you think it is possible for Africa? Anything is possible. Um, but for that to happen, it also means that our thinking has to be aligned. You know, um, the Francophone needs to start thinking as the Anglophone. The Anglophone needs to start aligning with the Francophone. That's a critical thing that needs to happen because currently we are artificially divided and that division is not helping. It hasn't helped in the past. It won't help now. It won't help in the future. So that is a critical area. It's a critical bridge we need to cross. Um, I think the other critical thing we need to do is we don't even need to call it any big name for it to start working. The reality is that Africa needs to be working with other Africans and Africa needs to be supporting other Africans. It's the way we're going to grow this thing. I prefer that than give it a big name, put it on big paper, and nothing actually happens. So there's a lot of work to be done, but I believe it's something that will eventually happen. Um, um, I, I do think there's a lot of alignment that needs to happen. Because, look, uh, we're in Ghana. We're surrounded by two, oh, three, three uh, French Francophone uh, countries. You, you, there's got to be a way we align before we can start, you know, going beyond just doing trade. You know, and this is beyond trade. So... Um, language is another barrier that we need to cross. And so, you know, they need to start learning a lot more English. We need to start learning a lot more French if we want to be really African. English and French have to become a fundamental because the communication without it, you know, nothing is going to happen really. Um, so that's a critical thing we have to do. Um, uh, you know, we've started this whole agenda for the single monetary, you know, which is uh, our hair is going to be postponed because of the... Uh, I don't think it should have been postponed, but, you know, it is what it is. It's going to be postponed. But those are big agendas, and I think we need to set those big agendas. But there are other little things that we can be doing to start the process happening. You know, uh, uh, currently, my understanding is that Africa trades with itself less than 50%. And its trade with the rest of the world is above 50%. How, how is that possible? If you go to Europe, most countries in Europe trade amongst themselves between 45 and 60%. And that's the way it's supposed to be. So, you know, I feel that there are basic things, everyday things that we need to start doing way before we even start talking about the big agenda and the big topics and all that. If we talk about the big topics and the basic things are not being done, we're, we're, we're fooling ourselves. I... Since you have traveled around Africa a lot, and you're also an aspiring presidential candidate, if you had the opportunity, or let me say, you get a nod to become the president of Ghana, what measures are you going to put in to coordinate with other African countries to help in the One Africa? To be I, I think I think I think there's a lot of things we can do with our neighbors. Uh, technology is one big area. I think we need to sync ourselves because currently we are operating as little hubs. You know, Nigeria is a big technology hub. Yeah. Uh, South Africa is a big hub for cloud computing. Uh, Kenya is a big hub for fintech. Yeah. You know. Um, the Northern African countries are big techno hubs for, I mean, at, at our level, techno hubs for trade and, and industry. Um, and Ghana, we are a big hub for services and all that. We can't continue. Do you get what I'm saying? It's not, we're, we're all isolated. 
So we are failing to actually see what can happen with a coordination. And I think that's one of the areas that I would like to stir up some engagement and say, you know what, you guys have got cloud computing, the world is going cloud, the world is going services based, you know, the world is going uh, uh, fintech digital and all that. How can we begin to bring these things together and leverage, you know, things to work? I would love, I would love, you know, that in my tenor, we have some of the cloud computing gurus in South Africa coming over here. The uh, fintech guys in Kenya coming down here. I want to see some of the guys who are good with, uh, you know, other things in Nigeria, come banking sector, you know, and, and other areas coming over here. I want Ghana to become sort of the ecosystem that drives Africa. And the beautiful thing about some of these things is that once we start getting people together and crisscrossing and cross-fertilizing and merging itself, something amazing can happen. And until we do that and we still remain as little silos, nothing happens in silos. Well, there's a popular phrase, divided we fall, together we rise. You know, So I think we need to start consciously doing these things. And the same applies for trading, the same applies for banking, the same applies for agriculture. Agriculture is a big thing for Africa. We've got everything to, in fact, we, we have what it takes to feed the entire world. Exactly. Africa has to feed the entire world. But whether we see it that we can do it if we come together is another thing altogether. South Africa is a big farming community. Zimbabwe is a big farming community. But they are stuck in South Africa and they're stuck in Zimbabwe. Why are they not coming upstream to invest? Why is it that when the government of Ghana and Cote d'Ivoire won foreign direct investment, it has to go outside of Africa? for its agricultural FDIs. Why? There are big farmers in South Africa, there are big farmers in Zimbabwe, indigenous African farmers in both of those countries. Why, why can't we get them here? Why, you know, so there's, there's a lot of, but it's a conscious thing that has to happen. But it has to happen. Of course it has to happen. <laughs> <laughs> there's this belief um, from Africans that um, Africans in the diaspora has a sort of responsibility in building Africa. What, what is your take on that? Um, as for responsibility they have, they, they owe it to their countries that whatever they've learned out there, the skills they've acquired, the funding, the monies they've gained out there, that they bring it to help um, Africa. That's what the Asians have done. That's what you know a lot of the Israelis did. Uh, is to go back home with the uh, resources uh, in whatever form it takes to, to help build their countries. But I think it will be erroneous on anybody's part to think that it's only diasporans who can do that because the reality is that no matter how long they've been out there, no matter how much skill they've acquired or how much money they have, you know, Africa is unique. Um, the people are unique. You need an understanding, uh, the anthropological understanding of how things work here to be able to effect any meaningful change. Because otherwise, you're going to be tempted to want to impose everything Western. Um, yes, by all means, learn what you learn from there. But when you come down here, you need to put your mind on the ground and say, what is it that works here and how does it work? And if it's not working well, how do I leverage my knowledge elsewhere, twist it around, shape it differently so that it works for this context? So I think it's a balance that has to be set, which is to say, you know what? Let the guys from the diaspora come in. Let's combine forces with the guys who understand things here. And let's together make something beautiful happen. And I think that's... I, I have been lucky, I have maintained quite a number of uh, relationships even when I was away. So it was a lot easier when I came back and I wanted to do this. I had friends, brothers, colleagues who 
understood the local context. I also had people who had both worked in Ghana and worked internationally and understood how the world works and how Africa works. And, you know, it was just beautiful bringing together all those minds together because that is the sort of uh, a mix of minds that we need to make something beautiful, something really prosperous happen. Um, I, I, nothing would happen if it's one-sided or diaspora or one-sided or... Um, you know, indigenous. It's not going to happen. It's got to be a, you know, it's it's the marriage of minds like that that makes new things happen. Because if it is just those in the diaspora, it means all we'll have is the things in the diaspora. If it's just those domestically, it's just that we have. But it's the marrying of those new things, you know. Uh, you know I, I say to people, you know, Bread is always going to be bread. Meat is always going to be meat. But bring it beautiful together. You have amazing burger, you know. <laughs> you look very intelligent. You have a lot of insights. So now let's get into it, personal. Why did you choose to stand for presidential candidates? Well, I mean, when you look at the work that needs to get done, it couldn't get done as a, as a district assemblyman. I'm not saying they are below me. I would happily go in any of those areas. You can't get it done by being an MP for just one constituency. There's a whole lot that needs to get done. And there's a whole lot that needs to get done to affect a whole lot of people very quickly. Um, and so... For me, for somebody who has worked in, you know, in policy environment and, and worked in different countries, understood you know, political angles to different things and understood how the world works, I felt it was crucial that the change we needed and the size of it could only happen at, this le at that level. Um, because otherwise, uh, you know, I've heard people say, oh, just brighten the corner where you are. But... Uh, Ghana is not a corner. You know, people's lives that we're looking to support, make better, are not corners. You know, everybody needs to be affected very quickly over, across board. And, and the only way to do it is at the highest level. Um, so, no, I'm not doing this simply because I want fame or I want anything. I, I think that's a big uh, set of work to get done. And it requires that somebody gets in there and gets it done. I, I, I have no emotions tied to this agenda, so it's not one of those things that people would say, oh, what's your motivation? And then I give a nice motivational speech. For me, this is a duty. It's a work that has to get done. There's no two ways around that. I can make it sweeter than that. It's work. It's got to get done, and, and I'm here to get it done. Um, uh, that's the kind of environment I, I've, I've worked in all my life, is that is there work to be done? Let's get it done, and let's get it done well. Uh, you know, I, I'm not into the whole, you know, emotional, uh, oh, what's the motivation? And then people ask me that every time. I'm glad you didn't ask, but people ask me that every time, as if, you know, running a state or country is a motivational agenda. No. You know, when I'm out of office, I can do the whole motivation stuff and say, you know, when I was going in, I was really, you know, it's a big thing on my shoulders. But, you know, wherever there's a will, there's a way. That it's not time for that. Uh, it's a lot of work to get done. It's a lot of work to get done. And we need to get it done. Wow. Indeed, there's a lot of work to be done. And there's, you know, the people I used to, leaders coming to say a lot of things and looking at the past the record shows but in your case i want to i want to ask on their behalf what different are you bringing on the table that will get them to support and then help you get them you know <laughs> that's a tough question because really all everybody, anybody needs to do is to look at their own lives. Uh, look at how we voted all this number of years and ask themselves if they feel that anything major has happened to their lives. 
Um, has anything happened to the individual lives? Has anything happened to assure them that they are leaving a legacy for their children that would make them, you know, rise above where they are? Uh, and if the answer is no, then you really don't even need me to give you another, you know, reason because uh, um, I am doing this because of what I have seen my fa or I've heard my father's generation, you know, uh, enjoy in this country. I'm not saying it's all about enjoyment, but this country should be able to make people's lives go far. I've seen how my parents' life went far from what they got in the Nkrumah era and all that and the eras uh, after that. Uh, and then I've also seen as a child growing up, things got stalled uh, sometime in the early, uh, late 70s and 80s. Um, and then we're in a new dispensation, which is our dispensation. And one of the questions we I ask myself is, am I just going to sit back and watch things run away as, as they have left, you know, the generations before us? So, in fact, if you look at it, we... You and I's generation is the most critical generation because we've got to do three times the job. We've got to do three times the work. Um, we've got to make sure that the dreams of the generation before us that were not fulfilled, they get fulfilled. Then we've got to make sure we do something for our own generation. We do something for ourselves. And then we also have to make sure that we leave some foundation or legacy behind for our children and their children's children to start building from because it'll be an indictment on us that after everything we've seen and experienced, we also live the scene and the generation after us also has to come and start from scratch. That'll be a big indictment. So we've got three times the work to do. Um, and, and I think it's about time we move away from this color party or that color party and let's all gather around and say, look, for once, for once, let this be about Ghana. Let this be about Africa. And, you know, the whole color thing is not, it's not taking anybody anywhere. You know, the color thing, uh, you know, I belong to this color, I belong to that color. It hasn't taken any, anybody anywhere. When you're born, the first thing in your blood is Ghana. The first thing in your blood is Africa. It's not some political color. It's not some ethnic, whatever, color. It's about this continent, it's about Ghana. So uh, there was an argument on Facebook the other day, somebody saying, oh, um, uh, the Tamar Road has been constructed, or oh, it was constructed under this government, and then somebody else said, but it's that government that found the money to do it. And there's a whole argument going on about it. And I say, so where is Ghana in all of this? Because it was a foreign company that came to build the, 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 the road. It was a foreign company that gained from the increased technical know-how. It was a foreign company that took the profit away. And yet nobody's talking about that. Yeah. We are all focused on about, this is my color, so I have to defend that color. And Ghana, right in front of us, is losing in all of that process. But because we are so fixated on the colors, I say let's get away from the colors, which is why I actually decided to run as an independent because then it's not about party A, party B, party C. No, it's not about parties anymore. I am here for Ghana and Ghana only. And I don't care whether, you know, you wear that color or that color. If you are the best man fit for a particular job, you get the job done. It's, it's as simple as that. Uh, we've got to move away from, we've got a long way to go. So this is not, we don't have the time to, you know, uh, that's not <laughs> good. I understand, guys. It's, it's really interesting. And um, we can go on and on and on and on. But as they say, time flies. So we will be bringing it to an end. I know you enjoyed this interview much. I'll, I'll, I'll try and bring him back again <laughs> but if you want me to bring him back again just comment on the comment section below and then i'll bring him back but your final words to Ghanaians and also people in the diaspora and all africans i say to let me start with africans i say to africans look we've heard africa rising you know and all that but it'll take us we need to understand that it'll take us and we've got what it takes for this continent to rise. Um, so let's get it done. 
um, to Africans again and to Ghanaians in the diaspora, I say, look, you need to take a chance on your country. You know, take one for the country. Come back, see what you can do and contribute to what we have here, and let's get it going. The more of us we, you know, we that come back, you know, the better we begin to mix the standards out there that we value so much. We need to start bringing it home, uh, get ourselves more accountable, expect more from ourselves in terms of customer relations, expect more from ourselves in terms of uh, governance standards. If that is the way we feel outside, let's bring it back here and let's bring our money back home. Let's bring our expertise back home. Um, yes, I know the argument is that, oh, they don't want us here. I want you here. So come and let's get this done. Um, I want to say to Ghanaians, look, we don't have another 27 years. We don't have another 60 years. We've got this one window this year, this 2020, to make something phenomenal happen. We, we, we have an opportunity to rewrite history and put this country back on its best path. And so let's do that. Let's do that for Ghana, not for the colors. You know, we, there's only Ghana in your blood, you and I's blood. So let's make this happen. My name is Mari Kofi Gan, and I'm running as an independent presidential aspirant. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for honoring this interview. In fact, I really enjoyed it. I enjoyed myself yes. too. <laughs> I really enjoyed it so much. But guys, um, thank you so much also for being there to watch throughout from the beginning to the end. But my last message to you guys is that let's not forget that this freedom, this country that we are enjoying now, our forefathers had to do their part. They fought for us, for us to enjoy this. But my challenge to you now is that what are you also fighting for the next generation that is years to come? My name is Mia Ieke Ganeri. Until then, I come your way with another episode. See ya. Hola. Pao. We go make them, make them. We go, we go make them, make them.